I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Humphrey Bogart, the image. How did it come about? Who was in charge of creating this character who's so vivid that you see him immediately when I use his name? And that voice and the cigarette in his hand and the confidence to take control of a movie so that 50, 60, 70 years later, it still is what you'd have to say the ultimate way for a superstar to control the narrative of an action movie, of violence, of romance. Stephen Kampfer has a book that is extremely helpful to understand the transformation because Hollywood is a very careful art form that is in conversation with actors and directors and producers and the audience. Tough Without a Gun, The Life and Extraordinary Afterlife of Humphrey Bogart. Stefan, congratulations and a very good evening to you. The revelation, he's born in 1899, that early when he was working in Broadway uh, in New York, he was understood as uh, a, a little a com- contemptuous and rebellious rich kid. And that was important in uh, Broadway in New York at the time because they didn't have many people coming from that sectarian specialty of of a Bogart, you know, people with money, people with educations. Well, it's true, and for one thing, it was it, it was an actual fact that his father was a prominent physician. His mother was probably the best known illustrator in America at the time. They had plenty of money. They lived in a fashionable uh, neighborhood in the Upper West Side of Manhattan, not so fashionable now, but it was then in a townhouse, and they had servants and all of that. And Humphrey Bogart is not a name like Rock Hudson that was made up, you know. It's, that was his real name, Humphrey. Who would want a name like that for a movie star? So everything was going against him, uh, except history. Uh, he he began as a juvenile, as you say, just somebody who was going on stage to say tennis anyone. And the reason that that juvenile said tennis anyone was so that everybody would get off the stage to uh, to look at the tennis match, so that a new bunch could come on and or they'd change the scenery and so on. It was a technical aspect of. of playwriting, and he learned his trade that way. He was in almost 20 plays on Broadway, and uh, finally, some producer noticed, you know, that when he's on stage, people look at him. They don't always look at the star. They look at this kid, and they decided to cast against the part with Petrified Forest, and he was going to play a gangster. It's a very strange thing. Of course, we now accept that that's what he is. Duke Mantee in Petrified Forest, yes. And um, Leslie Howard, the actor, was not only the star, he also produced the play, and he liked Bogart so much that when they bought the play for Hollywood, which happened all the time in those days, he insisted that Bogart come along. Then that's not what the studio wanted. The studio wanted Edward G. Robinson, some established heavy. And he said, no, no, it's going to be Bogart or nobody. And because he had the clout of being a producer and being, at that point, quite a star, though English, uh, he got his way, and Bogart went on the screen the way he had gone on the stage, as an unshaven desperado, and people bought it on screen as they had bought it on stage. One of the striking details about Bogart's life compared to today, Stefan, is that with the uh, the Petrified Forest play, this is before the movie, he was 37 years old. That's right. I'm very, I mean, in Hollywood today, 37 is a grandfather. It's no, ancient. It's an old man. There's no question about it. And when he made history by becoming a star, finally... You know, really with the Maltese Falcon, High Sierra to some degree, but the Maltese Falcon really established him. He was 42. That's, you know, Brad Pitt is 42, but he made it when he was 26. That doesn't happen today. And you're right. I mean, these would be considered uh, elderly character actors. Nobody would make it as a romantic lead at middle age. What I also am impressed by with Humphrey Bogart is that he seems indiscriminate. He didn't worry about the quality of the script or who sent it to him. He just kept acting. But that has to do with the uh, the studio system uh, that you had to you got a contract and you had to act when whatever they sent you. Well, you know, he had a very interesting view of the world. I mean, he was a tough guy in the sense of being hard on himself. He wasn't tough, really. One uh, uh, Cagney, James Cagney, once said he was about as tough as Shirley Temple in real life. But he was tough on himself, and he really did believe that the world could be divided, particularly in Hollywood, but also the whole world could be divided into two categories. The categories were professional and bum. 
And if you were a bum, you, you got drunk, you didn't know your lines, you bumped into the furniture, you had a lot of trouble with the script and so on. Today it would be you trashed your hotel room, you know. And no matter how uh, hungover he was, he knew his lines, and he made the 6 a.m. call all his life. He was a professional. His marriages, uh, because we have the fairy tale ending with Lauren Bacall and his children and his, uh, his death, his tragic death, and Lauren Bacall was with this, uh, uh, for, you know, for the latter part of the 20th century, always referring to, uh, to Humphrey Bogart as uh, the man she was always in love with. I'm struck by the marriages, especially the third marriage, to a woman I didn't know about, Mayo Methot. Is that how you yeah, say her name? Uh, she was uh, a disturbed woman, let us be kind. But, but that is a movie they haven't made yet, Stefan, that marriage. Well, that, 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 would be, that would be a violent movie. Yes. She was a violent woman. She was an alcoholic. She threw things at him. She once stabbed him in the back with a knife. It was a really terrible uh, scene for But him. the way you present uh, Humphrey Bogart, he, it's almost as if he's studying it for character acting. He, he seems entertained by her. Up to a point, I think he was, but when he saw her really vanishing into heavy mental illness... He thought he'd stick with her to the end because she'd have to try rehab. He would try everything he could, even though by that point he was involved with Lauren McCall. But he just couldn't leave his wife in that kind of prostrate condition. But when she refused to reform and just kept getting worse and worse, finally she gave up and said, okay, take him away, kid. And that was the beginning he, of, the, uh, of the last romance. The he called her Sluggy. And, and did he name his boat Sluggy as well? <laughs> yes, he called her Sluggy, and the boat was named Sluggy, and even he had caric caricatures around of the two of them fighting, but, you know, when you look back at it and you think, this is not really a marriage made in heaven, and, and I think he had to stop that. It was his third marriage, and I think he knew it was a mistake. And then when this lovely 19-year-old came along, I think he felt, people are going to say I'm robbing the cradle, but I am crazy about her, and she's crazy about me. Let me see if I can fix the third marriage, and if I can't, it's over, and that's the rest of the story. But all four wives were actresses, interestingly enough. He never really broke out of that. Uh, well, he's, that his, he is. said his range was Beverly Hills to Palm Beach, so yeah. that's where you would so. find actresses. He, yes, I mean, his idea of, of an out-of-town trip was to take his boat uh, out past Catalina. Right. And now, the uh, Petrified Forest is a breakthrough for him because he plays this vulnerable gangster who dies or has a wonderful, uh, I'll be seeing you, talking about the dead Leslie Howard. However, there is another movie in between. We're going to get to Maltese Falcon and certainly Casablanca, but High Sierra with Ida Lupino. The way you present it, the studio was uh, intimidated, worried about making, giving him top billing, even though he steals every scene he's in. I think at that point he was still not established enough. I mean, they, they knew that when he was on screen, uh, the definition of a star is someone you watch when there are other people on the screen. Right. So even if you don't like her, Streisand is a star. You know, they're just people you, you look at. People were looking at him all the time. And yet I think the studio was afraid to, to push him further than that. Also, you know, he was rebellious all the time, and he didn't like doing certain things, and he gave a lot of lip to directors, and authority was not something that he, deal, he dealt with very easily. Um, so they sort of subdued him in there, and he gave a, a rather subdued performance, interestingly enough. And although I think he's terrific as this, again, a desperado who is doomed, um, there's some great loyalties he has. One of them is to his dog, actually. The, the dog was his real dog in real life. And to a crippled uh, girl, and and what Ida Lupino represents is this kind of hopeless love. She loves him but knows that he has to be free, and to be free means to die. And the cops gun him down, as they probably had to. It's a tragedy, but it's one of those things that establishes in a certain way a star and gets him ready for the next big role. Stephen, Stephen, my memory of seeing Humphrey Bogart without the education of reading Stephen Canfer's biography of him when, as a young person is that there was this excitement because you weren't sure that he wasn't going to be self-destroyed any moment or that he wasn't going to do something so violent that you couldn't forgive him in the terms of virtue for Hollywood. Well, one of the things you see of Bogart, first of all, um, you know, Houston told me once that if you met uh, John Houston, if you met uh, Bogart on the street, you'd think he was not a pleasant-looking man, but that's all. But when he was in front of the Warner Brothers cameras and black-and-white movies, those guys really know how to light up a face. 
and he had a perfect face for black and white. I think if his first movies had been in color, he would not have been a superstar. But and, and that black and white smoldering quality, he had, and at the same time, that kind of coolness toward women, which made him super attractive to women, uh, they came across very easily on, on, on the screen. Uh, Tough Without a Gun, The Life and Extraordinary Afterlife of Humphrey Bogart. Stephen Canfer is the author. When we come back, the very important John Huston connection to uh, Humphrey Bogart. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. John Huston, towering figure today when you look at the successes of Hollywood. However, he once was a young man, and he had a script that nobody much understood how to deal with. It was it, what we now know as the Maltese Falcon, and he put together a cast with Humphrey Bogart in the center, and then they went and got Mary Astor. Uh, Mary Astor at the time was their second choice, I learned from you, Stefan. Uh, Humphrey Bogart, but then they brought in Gr- Sidney Greenstreet, who was 61 years old, and uh, they put together a cast that today we consider rock solid, but at the time it was pretty much what what was available. Well, it was what was available, but also I think that uh, Houston went out of his way to get a, a fat man who could really act and had an English accent, a, a very sinister type. In fact, uh, Sidney Greenstreet had been in musicals with Bob Hope, Roberta on Broadway. He he, was, he played some Shakespeare, but he was known as a comedian. So they got him for this, so there was some humor in that malevolence. And, of course, Peter Laurie, how can you beat that, this kind of uh, sinister Levantine? And uh, Bogart's own performance was such that he even changed the ending. The movie had been made twice before, and it's about Sam Spade, and Sam Spade is not a really very noble character. He is uh, involved with his partner's wife and, and pretty much any woman that comes along other than his secretary, Effie. But in this, at the end, he ha- is in love with Marie Esther, and he turns her over to the police, and when Ward Bond asks him what that, that statue is, that Maltese Falcon, he says, the stuff that dreams are made What of. a line. What a uh, line. It is, but he made that up. It's As not in the script. He wrote it, and yes. it comes vaguely from Shakespeare, but all from Humphrey Bogart. Now, we reorganize this same team for the movie that makes Humphrey Bogart and his time the superstar, and is today, Casablanca, uh, Sidney Greenstreet, uh, Peter Lorre, um, Mary Astor doesn't appear, and the choosing of the heroine in uh, for Casablanca, it, it was almost happenstance that they reached out to somebody who wasn't living there. Almost everything in that movie is happenstance because when they were making it up and writing it on an almost daily basis, they didn't know, and Ingrid Bergman didn't know, who she was going to go off with in the end. So she didn't know how to look at Humphrey Bogart or Pro Henri, whether, whether with affection, whether with disinterest. It was all very, very difficult for her. She was, however, probably the most beautiful woman in Hollywood at the time and really provided the movie with that kind of romantic center. And then Bogart, who in the end does what America did, that is to say he recognizes his role that he's going to have to join the fight. America Firsters right. tried to keep America out of the war. When it, it went into the war, then we had to go in full time. And Bogart, in the end, after saying, I stick my neck out for nobody, in the end, decides he's got to go off to fight with the Free French. And I think that uh, every man in, in the audience had quite a few women recognized they were Right, and they begin, they begin filming it in May of 1942, uh, which is very close to the bottom because the Battle of the Coral Sea and then what is to become Midway, the turnaround in the Pacific, but also in, in Europe, the Germans are running over everyone, driving, right. driving out civilization, and they finish it in August. And so, uh, Stefan, you go along in the way you present it, that Bogart becomes America, America goes to, uh, joins the fight. Well, there are two things. First of all, he did uh, represent America and, and and masculinity, I may say, at that point, because every male wanted to be in the Army and get, or in the Navy or in the Marines. They wanted that. A beautiful, beautiful friendship, the beginning the, of a beautiful friendship. That's right. This is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. That is, we're joining with England and France against fascists. But the other part was that Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, had actually left America. No president ever left the United States during a war and had gone to Casablanca to meet with, uh, with Churchill. And uh, when nobody knew about this till he returned. Then they, the press was informed, and so the word Casablanca was in every headline. Churchill, meet Casablanca, Roosevelt, Casablanca, Casablanca, Casablanca. Even the, the tabloids had it. And as a result, you can imagine what right. this must be like when Casablanca is 
in the title of a movie. You know, it, just, it just put it over the top. African Queen, 1951, for which Humphrey Bogart wins the Academy Award in 1952 for uh, a, a very modest character named Allnut, who is way past his prime. The striking thing here, again, he's reunited with John Huston, is that Catherine Hepburn is cast as the female in the lead, and they're not going to do it on a set. And the man who says that he moves from Beverly Hills to Palm Beach goes all the way off to Africa with his beloved uh, Lauren Bacall. And Houston and Bogart, did they talk about their ability to make magic, Stefan? I think um, Bogart so liked Houston, who he used to rib all the time, called him the monster. Uh, Bogart trusted Houston because he knew one way or another this guy was going to make him look good. He, was gonna, he had great instincts for using people. And Bogart and, and, uh, and Kevin Happen knew each other in Hollywood. They were not friends. I mean, she had eyes only for Spencer, and, and yet, on screen, they also had a magic, I think partly because they liked to kid each other. They had similar backgrounds. Both of them had doctor fathers, and both of them had some tragedy in their, in their lives. Um, Bogart's sisters did not do well in life. and uh, Died 33, very young. And Hepburn had a brother right. who committed suicide. So, you know, there was a lot that, that welded them together. Also, um, Houston was a heroic drinker, as was Bogart, and it paid off very well for them. Uh, Hepburn's father was a urologist and said to her, you must drink water all the time, keep hydrated, something you hear all the time in New York runners. So she drank bottled water, only it wasn't really bottled water. Some con man had bottled African water and put it in bottles, and she got really, really sick. Bogart drank a beer and whiskey only and ate uh, beans out of a can. So they did fine. They were never sick. Uh, Let that be a lesson to you. A note, because there's much more telling the tragic end, the the sad end of of Bogart, when he never sick a day in his life, and then he declines very quickly. All the movies we haven't mentioned that are spectacular, they've restored African Queen, and you've seen it, Stefan, and I highly recommend it to everyone. It's There's something, again, that's magic about that movie. It's a romance of two older people when it was made, uh, uh, the wise guys in Hollywood said, to, to Houston. It's about two old people going down a river. You lose a fortune when well, you saw what happened, and it's right. become a permanent film. And uh, the color restoration, the sound restoration, and the skill of Bogart and Hepburn to, to just two people in a boat with, you can imagine, the cameras and the lights around them. But well, to... she loved one scene particularly when he realizes after they've gone through the heavy water and, and gunfire that he loves her, and he gives her a kiss and he suddenly can't stand this. This is a guy who's never been in love with his life, and he's, you know, at least middle-aged. And he goes back to the furnace, uh, part of the, uh, the, the stove, part of the, uh, that's driving the ship, and he just sits there and looks off in awe and fear because this is real love. And she just loved that scene because he plays it alone, having been with her. And she realized, this is really an actor. This is not just a superstar. This guy can really act. Tough without a gun. The life and extraordinary afterlife of Humphrey. 